Hi, I'm Alicia from The Dizzy Cook, and today I am here with Dr. Edward Cho from Beverly Hills ENT at Cedar sinai and formerly of House Clinic. Dr. Cho is a board-certified otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon who is a fellowship trained in vestibular and balance disorders. He specializes in the diagnosis and management of BPPV, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, vestibular migraine, and triple PD, which is what we'll be talking about today, persistent postural perceptual disorder. You have to say that three times fast. <laughs> As a published author, Dr. Cho has presented on many topics in relation to vestibular disorders, ranging from BM, vestibular testing, and vestibular therapy. He has also aided in the review of two popular articles you may have read on the dizzycook.com, which explains more about common vestibular migraine symptoms and a general review of triple PD. Today, we will be focusing on triple PD, what it is, why it occurs in some symptoms, as well as a touch on a little bit of vestibular physical therapy, when it can be beneficial and harmful for vestibular disorders, and a little bit about a common vestibular symptom called tinnitus, which is often that annoying ringing in your ears, why that happens and why it can drive us crazy. Thank you so much, Dr. Cho, for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction, Alicia. I'm really happy to be here and just excited to start the discussion. Um, I, I'm always a firm believer that the more a patient knows about their condition, the more that they can help take charge of their recovery. You can have the best physician, the best physical therapist, but I feel like the patient is always the best advocate. So excited to, to be able to share the information. Of course, and that's something I've learned throughout my journey as well. And so I appreciate you taking the time to help us educate ourselves a little bit more about these illnesses. So um, if you could just start a little bit on your presentation about triple PD and exactly what that is and what it means. Yeah, great. So let me just share my screen. Um, I find that when there are some visual references, it's often a lot easier to learn. And then um, your readers, when they're watching the video, can can flip back, look at certain slides if they want to refresh their memory. And so, um, so as Alicia mentioned, I focus on the management of dizziness and vestibular disorders in Los Angeles. Um, a number of disorders that, that I see, and I would say that triple PD, three PD, however you want to call it, is one of the more common types of disorders that I see. Uh, the interesting thing about three PD is that, um, one would not consider it necessarily a diagnosis of exclusion. This terminology sometimes comes up when, when you have an entity that, that maybe is, is newer or people are not sure about. They think, oh, you have to rule everything out, and then you have this condition as a diagnosis of exclusion. But as a matter of fact, triple PD can be considered more like a diagnosis of inclusion. What that basically means is that you could have vestibular migraine, you could have BPPV, you could have vestibular neuritis, a hypofunction, and the triple PD can insert itself into it, either all the manifestations of it or just maybe a particular manifestation like the visual. And so I think the, the best way to be equipped as a patient is to really understand the condition yourself. Um, as I talk about the diagnosis, one of the most important things I want to emphasize about triple PD, vestibular migraine, other types of dizziness disorders, is that these are all mostly clinical diagnoses. Basically, that means there's a clinical criteria, and if you meet the criteria, then you have the condition. You don't need fancy tests, you don't need fancy imaging, MRIs to diagnose it. That's why I feel like Many patients can, can diagnose themselves. Physical therapists can diagnose themselves. You just need the, to have the right tools and be equipped. And so um, let me just enlarge this um, slide. So the diagnosis of triple PD. So whenever I, I and I see a lot of this in, in my clinic, whenever I, I, I talk with my patients, I, I tell them the three Ps, persistent, postural, perceptual. Those are really the main characteristics of this triple PD. So persistent, 
by definition, it's a non-vertiginous dizziness or unsteadiness that's present on most days for three months or more. The three months is fairly arbitrary, but that's just what's been said. Really, one of the key components is the non-vertiginous. In general, the triple PD is not vertigo. Vertigo, by definition, is an illusion that the room is moving, spinning, either actually spinning or spinning inside your head. Most patients with triple PD, it's not primarily spinning, but it's more like rocking, tilting, swaying, sometimes something that's a little less defined. And so that's, that's the persistent part of it. Postural. The position of your body can make a big difference. It tends to be much decreased, sometimes absent, minimal, when you're recumbent lying back, leaning backwards, neck and head supported. It tends to be worse when you're upright, moving around, doing activity, really triggered in that way. And then finally, the perceptual. That's really one of the key components of this triple PD and sometimes the most debilitating, something termed visual dependence. It's basically these scenarios that are pictured here. You know, does this make you feel more dizzy looking at this escalator? Grocery store aisles, really classic. Uh, looking at computer screens, trying to focus on knitting, really fine visual types of tasks. And what, what ends up happening with visual dependence is that your visual system becomes more susceptible to just visual sensory overload. Um, one of the main reasons for this is because our balance system is finely tuned. The main inputs into balance are visual, their inner ear, and then their proprioceptive, which basically means inputs from the neck and the rest of the body. What tends to happen with triple PD is the brain becomes unbalanced and starts to rely too much on the vision for balance. And so you are more susceptible to the visual sensory overload. Now, would this also include like scrolling on your phone? I know that's something I hear of all the time. Is that more, uh, would that be a part of that visual dependence as well? Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely, okay. Alicia. Scrolling on the phone, computer screens, um, driving in the car. Yeah, th that's all the visual dependence. Um, so yeah, no, no, per, uh, Interesting. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Now in terms of triggers, it's really important to know what the, some of the triggers are just because I often try to go back and figure out what the inciting event was. Um, so, so if you look at this graph, a full 45% is from some sort of vestibular disorder. And basically if you look at the breakdown, 25% some sort of acute vestibular disorder, maybe a vestibular neuritis, hypofunction, BPPV. A full 15 to 20% is actually from vestibular migraine. There's a lot of evidence that shows that people with a tendency towards migraines tend to be more susceptible to sensory overload and by definition, 3PD has a lot of sensory overload component. And so really a large portion of individuals with vestibular migraine can actually transition into triple PD. Um, you can see a full 35% are purely psychiatric causes like panic attacks, anxiety. I've definitely had patients where this kind of rocking unsteadiness triple PD symptom comes from some sort of uh, uh, more of a like an anxiety type of attack, and then have an other category, 20% can include traumatic brain injury, concussion, um, dysautonomias. That would be something like uh, orthostatic hypotension or something called POTS, which you start to hear a little more about uh, post-COVID syn syndrome or you know, right. after COVID vaccination, you get POTS type of symptoms. Um, okay. Yeah. So... Um, this is, it, it's kind of a busy slide, and, and um, you may want to come back to this slide later on just to review it, but Dr. Jeffrey Staub, he's a psychiatrist at the Mayo Clinic who really helped formulate the diagnosis for triple PD. The, the diagnosis formally came about in about, I think it was about 2014. Um, it was previously called chronic subjective dizziness. I think he formulated that about 2004, and prior to that, it had a variety of other sorts of names or ideas. But I feel like this flow chart, even though it's busy, if you break it down, it really helps you understand the process. So usually there's something that precipitates the issue, the vestibular crisis, anxiety. Just remember my previous slide about the causes, something that yeah. causes it. 
And usually there's an acute adaptation, the, the body's natural mechanism of adaptation to any sort of vestibular crisis. Um, visual somatosensory dependence basically means you become more visually reliant. You become more reliant on your body cues. Somatosensory means inputs from your feet, your neck, high risk postural control strategies. You actually change the way that you hold your posture when, when you're um, adapting. And then environmental vigilance basically means you're looking around, you're saying, oh my goodness, what in my environment might potentially set me off? The natural response, uh, the recovery falls into, you know, medical, behavioral, neurologic. But there are some individuals, and, and some of the predisposing factors include introverted temperament, pre-existing anxiety, uh, sometimes behavioral comorbidities like anxiety, phobias, depression, where there's this perpetuating loop, this failure of readaptation, where your body is constantly provoked, you know, being upright, moving around, motion, visual demands. As, as you all may know, our, our environment yeah. is so visually rich. Social media, looking at your phone, so many jobs require computers have to commute, especially in LA. And so it's, it's a very challenging issue that just seems to self-perpetuate itself. Because you can never actually give that, give your brain time to rest, it seems like. Exactly. I mean, you would almost okay. have to be like a hermit in a cave without <laughs> any TV, without any phone media in order to not be provoked like that. Okay. So how do we, how do we make this better if, if we can't live in a cave? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a, a really great point. Um, let me see. That's, yeah, so that, that's the uh, um, two okay. slides in, but um, we'll get there. One, one resource, though, I'd definitely like your readers to be aware of is yeah. there's this really great website called neurosymptoms.org dizziness that has a very good description of PP, the triple PD. Um, I'd rec I usually recommend my patients go to it just to get more information about it. And on that website, they, they have this breakdown, another way to think about triple PD, which kind of segues into your question about the, the treatment. And, and I feel like, you know, a lot of people are visual learners, so it's just nice to be able to put things in a visual space. And so, you know, once again, you have this dizziness trigger, whatever it may be, migraine, head injury, hypersensitive brain, basically mm -hmm. the summary of this PPPD, avoidance of neck movement, the neck becomes really stiff, can be anxious, avoid going out, fatigue, something called dissociation, where patients complain about feeling disconnected. I'm floating, yeah. I'm facing out, I'm sort of, yeah, it, it can almost feel like otherworldly, like you're just sort of floating and, and you talk to doctors and, and they don't really understand necessarily what you're saying. And, and I feel like in terms of treatment, what, what's highlighted in, in red really breaks it down well. Um, okay. There are medications that can be helpful for that brain hypersensitization. Um, usually they fall into the class of SSRIs, SNRIs, medications like Effexor, you know, whatever physician you're seeing may have a particular preference. But I've definitely seen that if you dose this really small micro doses, that's usually how I do it because mm -hmm. uh, that minimizes side effects. That, that tends to be better. Having a, um, a really good physical therapist is so key um, because physical therapists who understand 3PD know how to work with you to externally desensitize your brain. Um, one way I like to describe 3PD to patients is it's like your brain is just hypersensitized. Um, in in the, the neurosymptoms.org, they talk about um, if you use a computer analogy, rather than a hardware problem, it's more like a software glitch. You know, okay. imagine you have a computer, you have a lot of windows open, you know, computer starts coming down to a grinding halt, and basically all you're trying to do is reboot the computer. All the circuitry is intact, very capable of being rebooted. And, and I, I like to talk to patients about the inside out approach with medications. Even I, I use some of the migraine diet um, and then the outside in approach through physical therapy. And in some cases, cognitive behavioral therapy, psychological therapy can be helpful as well, just because you start to develop patterns of avoidance, you know, not wanting to go to 
certain places and, and avoidant behaviors. So, um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's basically the summary of 3PD. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so hopefully that's just some information that your readers can put into their pocket and, and be informed with and just get a, have a broad overview of the, the types of treatments that can be helpful. No, that's incredibly helpful. Um, I know we have some reader questions we will get to towards the end about uh, Triple PD, so we'll come back to that. Another thing we wanted to discuss that's a good segue is um, vestibular therapy. So you talked a little bit about how that can be beneficial for um, Triple PD. Is that also beneficial for other vestibular disorders or what do you recommend looking for? I know that's a lot of questions right there. <laughs> no, that's fine. So yeah, so you know vestibular physical therapy, I, I have a really great relationship with my vestibular physical therapist. Um, over the, I think I've been in Los Angeles about nine years, I've established relationships because I, I truly feel like any sort of dizziness condition, vestibular migraine, triple PD, it's, it's really a multidisciplinary approach. It's the patient, it's the physical therapist, you know, any, maybe a neurologist, other individuals, and you really want to work with as a team. And so I often communicate really closely with the vestibular physical therapist. I probably send about 80 to 90% of my patients to vestibular physical therapy, to the ones I work with. And if someone sees me for the first time and says, oh, I tried vestibular PT, but it didn't work. I usually ask them, who did you see and, and what did they do? Because the, the type of vestibular physical therapy can really matter. So I know in my experience, I was a I was initially going to vestibular therapy almost every day, which I think is a red flag right there. But I was also doing YouTube exercises, the VOR exercises, looking at my thumb, and I just continually got worse and worse and worse. What did I do wrong? <laughs> yeah, so um, generally the patients of mine, when they go to physical therapy, it's about once or twice a week. And, and you do, especially with triple PD or vestibular migraine, you do want to have a physical therapist who's at least familiar with those conditions. Because what most physical therapists are trained in in school are the typical VOR exercises, vestibulo-ocular reflux. It's really those eye and head movement exercises, looking at your thumb. And while, so, so those were originally developed for vestibular hypofunction where you have a weakness on one side most commonly from a virus and it works really well for those but you know if, like if you met neuritis exactly vestibular yeah. neuritis yeah but but if you have triple pd if you have brain hypersensitivity sometimes this will actually make you feel worse and i've had plenty of patients who come to me and say they felt worse after vestibular physical therapy so what do you recommend looking for in a therapist? Is there a certain qualification that you like to, to see or do you recommend going through your doctor? Um, right. How yeah. do you find well, that perfect therapist? Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of your doctor, I guess it depends on the, <laughs> the their, their background and yeah, and um, yeah. Their, their relationship with the community. But w one thing I wanted to do, yeah, let me just pull up my summary slide of that just because I, I feel like it's it's just something I don't want to pass by it too quickly but um, hold on let me great so um, once again a lot of information readers can go back to the slides but what I did is I looked through some emails when I first came to LA I emailed a whole bunch of physical therapists and I asked them about uh, certain characteristics certain qualities like things that clue you into there they they may know about triple pd or, or be dedicated to physical therapy so um there's something called the herdman course used to be called the herdman course susan herdman was one of the the pioneers of vestibular physical therapy she was out of emory in georgia i think she's retired but there is a vestibular certification it's not an official certification but it's it's a it's like a three or four day intensive course um it's, and it's run by Dr. Richard Clendaniel, who's in Duke University. A couple of years ago, they had it in LA. They have it in various sites. So I usually ask PTs, have you done the Herdman course? You know, because okay. that at least indicates that they're willing to invest the time and, and have some exposures. 
The other thing that, that usually clues me in that someone is committed to vestibular physical therapy is they have these goggles, video nystagmography goggles. Basically, these are infrared goggles that give you an enlarged view of the eye. Of course, mm -hmm. the physical therapists don't need it all the time, but for BPPV, um, which may be a topic of a, another talk, there can be certain complex forms where you really need to be able to see an enlarged view of the eye when the patient is in the dark. Because when the patient is in the dark, you, you actually can see more eye movements. So I asked them, have you done the Herdman course? Have you, um, you know, are you familiar with video nystagmography goggles? Do you use those? And then are you familiar with triple PD specifically? Um, you know, in terms of treatment, I don't know all the nuts and bolts of what the physical therapists do, but um, some of the terminology that they've used is visual optokinetic motion desensitization, sensory reweighting, habituation therapy, basically ways of trying to rewire the way your brain is processing information, manual neck physical therapy. Really having those hands-on skills are key, not only for triple PD, but also for, for vestibular migraine, because often the neck is, is involved in, in these conditions. That's really interesting. When would you not recommend someone visit a physical therapist or maybe delay that in their treatment? I know once I started to uh, feel better and have more 100% days was when I went back to vestibular therapy and it did really work out well for me. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question, um, Alicia. I, you know, on the onset, I usually offer my patients physical therapy, but I have had some patients who are so flared with their, particularly with their VM attacks, mm -hmm. that doing some of the exercises, even as mild as they are, some of the manual neck physical therapy is too sensitizing. And so some of these patients may need to initially be on the vestibular migraine diet, eliminate the triggers, be on supplements, um, start low doses of medications in order to try to help their symptoms. But I would say that's more the exception. Usually by the time the patients see me, at least they're a little more stable level and are better able to do the vestibular physical therapy. Oh, that's really interesting to hear because I feel like when I was first looking for doctors, I didn't know what I was doing, but it's kind of nice to know that people have researched on their own by the time they get to you and are, are on their way to getting better, I guess. Yeah, and, and it may just be the, the Los Angeles population, you know, big <laughs> dense city, a lot of doctors, and, and uh, many times when I've seen patients, they've already seen two or three other doctors. Wow, okay, that's good to know. Um, let's branch off a little bit into tinnitus, which is that ringing in your ear. Um, it can be very common with um, all, pretty much all of the vestibular disorders. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, first, um, I do wanna give a disclaimer that I don't claim to be a tinnitus expert. The uh, yeah. main reason I say that is because in my clinic, patients usually have to have dizziness to see me and then they have associated tinnitus. I don't primarily treat tinnitus. But um, the, the basic definition of tinnitus is somebody perceiving sound in the absence of sound. So there's really no noise, but then you hear the sound. Um, the interesting thing about tinnitus is another way to break it down is there's something termed subjective tinnitus where the patient is the only one who can hear it. And then really rare cases of objective tinnitus where someone on the outside can actually hear it. Usually those are more like oh. vascular or other medical conditions. But okay. what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm really going to focus in on, on um, what, what's most relevant to your readers to vestibular migraine. So let me um, once again, just share, just because I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So it's been very helpful today. Yeah, of course. Yeah. My pleasure. So um, yeah. So, you know, broadly speaking, I think it's, it's helpful for VM patients to know two broad categories would be something called inner ear tinnitus, and then something that's not inner ear tinnitus, or broadly speaking, it's somatic tinnitus. Inner ear tinnitus is by far most common, affects maybe like 15% of the population. It occurs mostly because of hearing loss. Um, and and I, I like this diagram, I mean, it's kind of complicated, but I just, it shows a little bit of the complexity of the brain. You know, here's the inner ear, the cochlea, 
the eighth nerve, the hearing nerve. And basically tinnitus occurs in the brain, in the auditory cortex. And a lot of research has been done into tinnitus and, and it shows that what ends up happening is that part of the brain starts to become disordered for lack of a better term, that, that because of inner ear injury, because of hearing loss, the, the, the frequencies you're not able to hear start to cause the brain to generate noise on its own. I usually describe it to patients like a phantom limb syndrome. Suppose you have okay. someone in a war, get their arm amputated. Some of these individuals have horrendous pain where their arm was. That's called phantom pain. It's, it's really the same concept with tinnitus as well. It's usually the hearing loss frequencies, noise-related hearing losses in higher frequencies. And most people have the tinnitus in the higher frequencies. And so kind of like that phantom limb syndrome. That's fascinating. I would always assume that it just came from your inner ear and not exactly from your brain. Yeah. So, so the yeah. inner ear is, is often a trigger, but it's actually the brain. And I think that's an okay. important distinction because many, sometimes patients ask me, are there ear treatments I can do? Yeah. You know, do I need to inject steroids? Do I need, you know, this surgery? But unfortunately, a lot of procedures to the ear don't have too much impact on the brain. I mean, sometimes it can, sometimes it can't, but it's, it can be pretty challenging to, to, um, to really directly affect this primary auditory cortex. That being said, if someone has wax blocking their ears and they have hearing loss because of the wax okay. and tinnitus, that's a pretty easy fix. You take the wax out, you can hear again, and then the brain is happy and, and you don't have <laughs> any tinnitus. But you know, for the most part, inner ear tinnitus is, is pretty challenging. Yeah, if only we were all that lucky, right? Yeah. Um, so can you explain, is there anything out there? I know that I've done a little bit of research on a, a few supplements for um, vestibular.org that can help, um, like lemon bioflavonoids, but is there really any sort of treatment for tinnitus or does is it one of those things where you have to treat the cause and not the symptoms? Yeah, that's a good question. And you know, actually, I have a whole nother set that talks about the non-inner ear tinnitus. But in terms of inner ear okay. tinnitus, what I would say is that really, if you look at a lot of the treatments, they all focus on habituation. Broadly speaking, habituation is like when you get a wool sweater, uh, you know, initially wear it, it's a little bit scratchy. If you keep scratching at it, it'll stay pretty scratchy. But then if you kind of wear it for a while, your brain doesn't notice. And that's usually what most treatments for inner ear tinnitus are focused on, whether it's background noise, whether um, it's like these, um, th there's certain types of hearing devices that put music in the ear, basically ways of trying to habituate the brain and make the tinnitus go into the background. In terms of lemon bioflavonoids, um, you know, the success rate is not necessarily that high. Maybe it's like okay. 10 or 20%, but, but, but they're very safe and they're over the counter. One of the mechanisms that's thought to, for, for them is, is that perhaps they increase blood flow into the inner ear and that can help tinnitus in some individuals. But in terms of inner ear tinnitus, uh, you know, most of the treatments are focused on habituation. Um, okay. As I was hinting though, there's really a, a, another... I would say it's not as large as inner ear tinnitus, but it's, it's another category of tinnitus called somatic tinnitus, basically not inner ear. This is the type of tinnitus that you see in TMJ patients. You see in patients who've had whiplash. You see in patients who have migraine symptoms. And okay. you know, one of the main differences with somatic tinnitus is that, so, so this is the cochlear nucleus, the bundle of cells right after the, the cochlea that plugs into the auditory cortex. Well, there's a lot of evidence that the trigeminal nucleus, the trigeminal nerve, which is primarily affected in migraine VM, has connections to this cochlear nucleus. And because of these connections, anything that irritates the trigeminal nerve can have a tendency to uh, contribute, irritate the cochlear nucleus, the vestibular nucleus, and cause tinnitus. And so when it's that particular type of case, then you focus on treatments for the trigeminal symptoms. If it's VM or migraine symptoms, you primarily treat the migraine. 
If it's neck, you do manual neck physical therapy or any other treatments um, that are necessary for that. So um, this is kind of a, a, an area of tinnitus that's, that's maybe not as widely recognized, but I've definitely had some home runs in patients who have this somatic tinnitus where they can, they can potentially resolve their symptoms once you uh, uh, work on the cause of the symptoms. Okay, that's good to know. I know we did get a question from someone that said, um, is there a difference between, do your patients mostly experience pulsatile tinnitus, tinnitus or um, general tinnitus? Yeah, so, so what I would say is that's actually, so tinnitus has a lot of breakdowns. That's, that's yet another category. The general tinnitus would be more that pure tone, the ringing, maybe low tone, the pulsatile is when it's pulsating like your heartbeat. And so pulsatile tinnitus is far more rare than, than the general tinnitus, like the pure tone. Pulsatile tinnitus tends to be more medical, but there are a lot of blood vessels that are running through the head. And so there, there may be certain conditions like eustachian tube dysfunction that sometimes plug up your ears and then you're able to hear head noises more. And so that's, I would say that's, that's a little bit different than than the somatic tinnitus that I'm, I'm talking about. Okay, good to know. And then um, is it common with vestibular migraine? Do you see this with a lot of patients? You know, I would say tinnitus is something, I mean, it's, it's overall a very common symptom because a lot of patients over time have hearing loss, but it's not such an uncommon thing that I see with um, vestibular migraine patients either before, during, or after an attack. Sometimes doctors confuse it with Meniere's disease because Meniere's mm. disease also has tinnitus as well. And that would probably be a discussion of a whole, whole other talk. Another um, time. <laughs> yeah. You know, a couple of other, um, couple of other pictures though I wanted to show and, and impress upon your reader's mind is just remember migraine, kind of going back to migraine, vestibular migraine, has to do with the trigeminal vascular system, this trigeminal nerve that provides sensation to the scalp, to the face, to the upper neck. That's really the key. And another picture, and just look at the connections, the trigeminal nerve, how it connects to the upper cervical nerve roots. That's why a lot of people with migraine headaches can get neck pain or the neck can trigger migraine symptoms. And then, um, yeah, and then let me see. Yeah, and, and then I think that's, yeah, basically it in terms of the slides, but really, um, I, I just put those slides up because I really want to emphasize you, you whenever you think about migraine, vestibular migraine, you think about the trigeminal nerve and you think about all the interconnections it has to the cochlear nucleus and tinnitus and to the vestibular nucleus and VM, you know, and and, and once you treat the trigeminal symptoms, the diet, supplements, um, maybe some low dose medications, you usually treat the underlying symptoms treat uh, yeah treat the underlying symptoms i uh, yeah it was that was definitely true for me um overall you know my vertigo that intense vertigo was the first symptom to go along with the dissociative symptoms and then i was just kind of left with this general background dizziness i, I started to feel less like i was on a boat and more just like that fuzzy feeling with the brain fog and then that eventually went too but everyone asked me oh, what did you do for that on the boat feeling? What did you do for the vertigo? And, and I found myself just saying, you know, it's the whole treatment plan, not just treating one symptom. Yeah, it's, exactly. You know, apart I from the other. That. Yeah, I think we have time for two or three more questions. So I'd love to get a few um, about triple PD. Is it possible to recover from triple PD even without an early diagnosis, I know it's been said that an early diagnosis is key. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, in terms of triple VD, I see it a lot in my clinic and I see patients who have newly onset within a few months. I've seen patients who have 10, 15, 20 years down the road. What I would say is over time, the longer you've had the diagnosis untreated, the harder it is to have the brain relearn, retrain itself. But I would say it's not entirely impossible. I, I remember one patient who had had triple PD for 20 years. She had had surgery, vestibular nerve section, 
that didn't really help her symptoms. And even though we didn't get her to 100%, she was at least able to ride her bike and, and do some more activities. And she was really appreciative. And so I would say earlier treatment generally is better. It, it prevents the brain from just getting into patterns of processing that are, that are dysfunctional. Um, so generally early treatment is better, but if, you've, if your readers have had symptoms 10, 20 years, it's definitely not hopeless. I think there's still, there's always hope. Okay, it's nice to hear even just a year or two is not that long versus Yeah, yeah, years. I mean, in, in the realm of vestibular 3PD symptoms, year or two is, yeah, that, that's, not, that's not long at all. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm thinking more like 10, 20 years. <laughs> um, someone had mentioned that their ENT said BM and triple PD treatment is the same. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, what I would say is there's a lot of overlap between the two. Because people who have a tendency towards migraine headaches have a tendency towards sensory overload, you know, visual sensitivity, light and sound sensitivity, many of the modalities do overlap. Um, also, one of the earlier slides I showed that about 20% of the time triple PD arises from vestibular migraine. So I would say for the most part, there is a lot of overlap between the two. Manual neck physical therapy, visual optokinetic desensitization, habituation, uh, yeah, definitely an overlap between the two. Okay. And then uh, what do you think about the NVNS, so the non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation, um, also kind of known as gamma core, uh, as far as a treatment for triple PD? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and that's something that some of my patients, a couple of my patients started asking me about. When I looked it up in the literature, it looks like they did the study back in maybe around 2018. So it's been around. Um, the gamma core um, cephaly is a little different, but the gamma core device is a non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation. And, um, you know, in terms of, I'm not really sure how well it works for triple PD because I don't have an extensive experience. That being said, I have some physical therapists who are trained in vagal okay. nerve stimulation techniques. They actually do PT. And what they tend to find is for triple PD or vestibular migraine or any sort of patient with dizziness, when they apply these vagal nerve techniques, it tends to slow heart rate down, tends to relax the brain and the mind. You know, a lot of the vagus nerve can have an effect on, on just some of the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight response. And so a lot of the vagus nerve treatments have a way of calming the brain down, whether it's with physical therapy or potentially with the, um, the gamma core device. And so um, I, I, you know, I think it can potentially be a helpful treatment. I just heard that it's very expensive, unfortunately. <laughs> and so I, that may be a limiting factor. If you have a PT who's familiar with vagal nerve treatments, that, that would probably be a, a, a good place to start. Yeah. And they've also given me a discount on Dizzy Cook. So if anyone watches this oh, and, and needs um, a little financial assistant, there are, there are ways. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's it's been helpful for me. I started it postpartum and I had a lot of postpartum anxiety and it's interesting you kind of mentioned that fight or flight response and and how that connects because that's really what I was struggling with um after pregnancy and and giving birth and I think it's really helped with that. So it's interesting to hear you talk about how that treatment can help as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I looked at some of the early studies in 2018, they talked about using gamma core for primarily those symptoms. Yeah, that fight or yeah. flight response, some of the anxiety, just really the heightened sensitivity of the central nervous system. And so I, I think it, it may play a role with that. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And I know we didn't cover everything. Um, there was just so much and we were trying to condense it into something very digestible for people, but hopefully you will come back and we can do more um, on VPPD, Meniere's disease, and uh, you know maybe a little bit more of VM, answer some of these readers' questions. Of course, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm always happy when information can be um, broken down into bite-sized digestible chunks, and so I think we, uh, we were able to work within our time frame and time limit.
Yeah, and can you uh, tell people where to find you if they're interested in making an appointment with oh, sure. you? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm over at the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Um, I'm just trying to think. Probably, uh-huh. Uh oh, well, I think if they Google you. Yeah, and I do, I, they, do I pop up? Okay. <laughs> I think if they look at Beverly Hills ENT. Yeah, yeah, Beverly Hills ENT. That's where it, it may pop up. You know, generally the way I run my practice is my initial visit will be in person just because I feel like I need to examine, really try to understand uh, an individual's condition. And then um, about 90% of my follow-ups I do through video telemedicine because I find because I work with trusted physical therapists, they give me information about the, the individual's physical examination and a lot of what we discuss are symptoms and and ways of treating them. So the, the video telemedicine visits are really nice for people who are farther away, yeah. like Northern California or, or San Diego. Really, I don't think I've seen my neurologist in about two years in person. So <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much, Alicia. I hope this is helpful for you and your readers. It will be.